Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Freemasonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. I'm your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 207. So, you know, it just dawned on me that for the better part of 200 and six other episodes, I say that this is a Freemasonic podcast. I don't even know if that's a word. Freemasonic. It's gotta be inappropriate at some level. (laughs) Anyway, last week we discussed the survey results, and we had a good response to that, and I am hopefully going to be putting together a little bit of a presentation for uh, lodges in the area to take a look at those and see what they can discern from them, because it is not the end-all best survey in the world, right? But perhaps we can do better by these survey results. So in addition to that, as well as I promised, I will publish those results in a Midnight Freemasons post as well. But if you missed out, on those survey results. We went through them one by one and discussed a little bit. Episode 206, just last week, we had a good time. In the news, coming right around the corner is the Masonic Restoration Foundation. And uh, if you make it out to Pennsylvania for that, stop by. We have a booth for the Masonic Roundtable. Brother John Ruark and Brother Jason Richards will be present. And if you tell Brother Jason Richards, hello. He will kindly stamp your Masonic passport if you have one. If you don't have one, I'm sure somebody around the area will be peddling the goods. So pick one up. Head over to the Masonic Roundtable table, which oddly enough is probably a uh, six foot long garage sale table, and ask Jason to stamp your book. He has a great embosser stamp, and it's just like you would get on your Lodge dues card, but it says the Masonic Roundtable. It's pretty cool. And they love to nerd out on Freemasonry, so stop by and chit-chat. Now, now also, right on the Midnight Freemasons this last week on Monday, we had a special guest presenter or a guest writer, and that was Brother James Dillman, who is the president of the Masonic Society, who publishes the Masonic Society magazine, and they are the, they're almost like a Masonic order unto themselves. It's uh, pretty neat, uh, but they've got something going on called the Quarry Project, and if you want to know all about what the Quarry Project is, well, go to www.midnightfreemasons.org and find out. It's a good article. I got some pretty cool news. I had alluded to a while back about a paper that I had written for the AMD, or the Allied Masonic Degrees, if you're unfamiliar with that. We do cover that in one of the first episodes of this show, so you want to go back to probably somewhere between episode 5 and 20 is one in there about the AMD. Or you can just head on over to Google and search AMD, and you can read their website. And primarily what the AMD is, is a research body who holds basically the patent or the rights to perform a few degrees that did not have a home in the Scottish Rite or the York Rite or anywhere else. So anyway, I wrote a paper for them and it finally was, to my surprise, published. The paper is called The Word and the Theory to Back It Up. And uh, it was the first iteration of just a topic I wrote about initially, which was about four pages. Since then, I had no idea. I thought they didn't like the paper. And I went ahead and I have published it somewhere else. And now the paper has gone on even more so. And it's actually two or three more pages long. So it's getting longer and longer. And I actually do a presentation on it now, but they published it in miscellaneous. So it was a really cool honor. And it's one of the first versions of that paper. So if you get miscellaneous, check out page 92 of uh, this year's or 2014, I believe it is. Let me know what you think. The other version, I believe we may have published it on the Midnight Freemasons. I'm not sure. However, it was cool to be published. Absolutely. Again, it's much longer and all around better in the newer version. So keep that in mind if you decide to read it. The old version doesn't have citations or anything like that. It's just kind of a fun ride, if you will. I do want to put this out there and I put a post up on the Facebook page inviting all the Grand Masters, uh, Excellent High Priests, Super sovereign grand inspector generals etc like if you have any kind of title within masonry and you're the head of a body or you know you're part of the supreme council and you want to get a message out for your year or something like that go ahead and shoot me a message on the facebook page or you can email me at wcypodcast at gmail.com and i'd love to have you on if you want to come on the show and i'll just interview you and we can talk a little bit about your goals for the year and what's important to you about masonry that we need to focus on so just to keep that in mind if you'd like a way to reach a bunch of brothers 
this is a great medium to do that. I don't charge to do that or anything, so don't think there's a cost associated. Absolutely not. Uh, just come on the show and talk. That's what we do. So also, I want to say that there were a ton of lodges out there that link this show and have asked me for HTML5 codes for a little player on their website for the lodge or whatever. If you're one of the guys who takes care of your lodge website and your lodge wants to put a link to the show on your lodge website, then just shoot me an email. I'd be more than happy to. That's uh, really cool and I'd be super honored to be on your lodge website. In addition to that, if you guys want a link to the Masonic Roundtable, an HTML5 code player. I can send you one of those also, or the Masonic Radio Theater. Any number of those things are out there. Speaking of other podcasts, I I did want to mention to everybody that everybody thought the Digital Freemason went away and you couldn't download those episodes anymore. And uh, if you guys don't know, the Digital Freemason is kind of what started my mind reeling about starting a Masonic podcast a few years ago, shortly after I started Brother Scott Blask and gave it up. And his episodes are still out there, and we link those. So if you go to the Masonic Podcast Network and you just kind of click through a bunch of the podcasts that are there, they're all Masonic ones anyway, now you'll get to the Digital Freemason, and you can listen to all the episodes there. It's about 120 of them. And uh, it, Brother Scott Blaskin is the godfather of Masonic podcasting uh, in my eyes. So it's really cool that those are still out there. And so if you want to, if you're all caught up on all your Masonic podcasts and you just need more, I'd definitely go back and check out those. So that'll lead us into the reading of this week, which is called Freemasonry, the Sleeping Giant. Freemasonry, the Sleeping Giant by Richard A. Kidwell, Grandmaster Arizona. Most worshipful brother Kidwell presented this challenging paper as the keynote address at the Conference of Grand Masters of Masons in North America on February 22, 1982, the 250th anniversary of George Washington's birth. MSA is pleased that Most Worshipful Brother Kidwell allowed us to use it as a short talk bulletin. Freemasonry, the Sleeping Giant. What a challenging topic to introduce. It brings to mind the familiar story of Rip Van Winkle, who slept so long he failed to make his contribution to the world. When he awakened, he found himself out of touch. He was unable to accommodate to the changes which had taken place while he slept. Is Freemasonry sleeping while the world is going by? Is Freemasonry an escape into an unreal world of dreams? Or is Freemasonry an active and vital force in the shaping of the future? When we are asked what is Freemasonry, we respond with a description of our ancient and honorable fraternity. To the layman, according to Webster, the word Freemasonry has become an uncapitalized noun, meaning a natural or instinctive fellowship or sympathy. Fellowship is defined as a company of equals or friends sharing a community of interests, activity, feeling, or experience. Sympathy is defined as united or harmony in action or effect. Thus, Freemasonry in its derived definition becomes a natural community of equals bound by shared experiences and interests and united in action. Certainly, at one point in our nation's history, Freemasonry was not sleeping, though proportionally no greater in number than today. The community of Masons did indeed display unity in action, and they did indeed produce a harmony in effect. Our founding fathers took pains to create a republic which would protect America not only from tyranny of foreign governments, but also from any proposed domination by our own government. They agreed that the best government is the least government. The primary cement binding these men together was the desire for freedom and justice. The war for independence grew out of negotiations for restoration of usurped rights, rights which had been granted to the citizens of the British Empire since the time of Magna Carta. When the negotiations were unproductive, the cry of taxation without representation may well have led St. John's Lodge to exchange the apron for the tomahawk and sweeten the waters of Boston Harbor with good English tea. There is some evidence that... The colonial lodges were made up of an elite group. George Washington is said to have paid fees amounting to $20 for his degrees, a fee that was far beyond the aspirations of many less affluent men. But there is also evidence in citing indicating that masonry was active on the frontiers. Members of the order made themselves known to the brethren and probably accomplished a good deal of informal recruiting and initiating of good men who were also dedicated to preserving peace and harmony. These informal tavern lodges, quote-unquote, provided the only Masonic communication available outside the established population centers. Thus, there were many unsung Masonic heroes working for the preservation of the way of life 
that had already become precious to them. These men instinctively knew what sort of foundation had to be laid if this land was to survive. They were inspired with the realization that masonry is morality in action, and that their obligations at the altar of Freemasonry were sacred promises that required appropriate action. They were committed to a pursuit of excellence embodied in the teachings of the fraternity, the urge for casting off bonds of oppression, for seeking equal rights for all, and for demanding the intellectual, moral, and spiritual freedom of the individual has always characterized Masons, not only in this country but in others. Witness the great Masons around the world, Benito Juarez in Mexico, Simone Bolivar in South America, Jose Rizal in the Philippine Islands, for example. Wherever the need for reasserting the doctrine of right and freedom has emerged, Masons have been taking the leading role in the quest for intellectual and moral liberty. From the scattered Masonic lodges and congregations of sojourning Masons in our own 13 colonies, the influence of Masonic principles made itself heard through our Declaration of Independence, our Articles of Confederation, and our Constitution with its Bill of Rights. Many of these names are familiar to you all. George Washington, John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, Edmund Randolph, a list of these leaders would constitute an honor roll of Freemasonry, and it would include a great portion of our founding fathers. Such an honor roll must also include Masons who contributed in a less public manner, such as Brother D. Montesquieu, who, as early as 1748, wrote the necessity for three branches of government and a system of checks and balances between these branches. Of course, no listing of honored Masons of colonial times would be complete without paying special tribute to our own worshipful brother George Washington. Not only was he an outstanding Mason at the time and a universal choice to become General Grand Master of the Grand Lodges of the country, but he also served as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army, Chairman of the Constitutional Convention, and First President of our new nation. The principles which he encouraged and were directly responsible for the development of our Republic. We are proud to honor him today on the 250th anniversary of his birth, indicative of the future of our form of government, were the words of Benjamin Franklin at the conclusion of the Constitutional Convention. As he emerged from the meeting room, he was asked what form of government we had. He replied, a republic, if you can keep it. And that is the question facing our nation today. Can we keep it? Masons helped to form a nation based on human liberty. Those Masons were knowledgeable and concerned. They realized that the granting of any right implied a concurrent responsibility. Over the centuries, we have shown a representation of Masonic brothers in positions of eminence and authority in our government. However, we have never been able to match the numerical representation and power exercised by the 13 out of a total 39 signers. Documents and plans for government as masterfully drafted as our Constitution, however, do not make government. They only make government possible. Governments are made by people. People who are not limited to consideration of the monetary problems of the present, but instead look to the heritage and tradition of the past and to the unlimited frontiers of the future. These people see the American Eagle not as a scavenger and eater of carrion, but as a soaring symbol of the ideals of those who founded our country. Free governments are made by people who have the imagination to recognize the glory of the development of a nation, who have full knowledge of their rights as individuals and are ready and willing to devise effective means for the preservation of those rights. If we as Masons want to assert greater prominence in the government of our nation, we must first become knowledgeable. Good Masons are informed and responsible citizens who know the issues and are willing to stand up and make themselves heard on matters in accord with the proven principles of our craft. Good Masons lead the people in exercising our right to vote on candidates and issues. But the key word is knowledgeable. We need to first educate our youth and our candidates in terms of intellectual rights, individual and civic responsibilities, and moral conduct. We must make Masons in fact rather than Masons in name. Our brotherhood has the potential for wielding a great deal of power in our local and national affairs. To do so, we must also make ourselves known and respected among the people. We must let the public know the principles for which we stand and become attractively visible in our communities. Our nation today needs the active support and participation of every Mason, as it did when our Constitution was formed. While we can never hope to achieve the epoch-making accomplishments of our brothers, of our brethren in George Washington's time, we must maintain the work which they accomplished. We must remember, too, the work which they accomplished. 
We must remember, too, that in honoring these founding fathers, we are truly honoring their adherence to their Masonic ideals and their dedication and zeal. Today, we need to revitalize those ideals and help America return to a new dedication. Many of our people have lost perspective and are viewing this era in terms of a leisure ethic rather than a work ethic. They are looking to government for solutions to all their problems rather than depending upon their own convictions and abilities. We are experiencing a decline in respect for law, for morality, for quality, even for truth as a guide to our actions. We are threatened both from without and from within. And once again, it becomes the obligation of masonry to take up our working tools and construct a bulwark of defense that will stand against any adversary. The solution is within our grasp. We have the knowledge and the materials to shape the future of our fraternity and to influence the future of the nation and of the world. The way we use our capabilities will determine our destiny. Masonry has always dedicated its efforts toward taking good men, one at a time, and making them better men. Then, in periods of distress and social upheaval, these good men, imbued with the philosophy of our craft, have stepped forward to lead the world back to the concept of liberty and justice. The founders of our country were that sort of men. George Washington, the father of our country, was one, as were a great many of those who stood with him when this nation had its precious birth. All of us are Masons, and thousands of our government leaders are Masons. If we have truly accepted our Masonic education and our Masonic obligations, we have only to unite our thoughts and actions to create a resurgence of those virtues on which our nation was founded. We need to apply our working tools and our collective pursuit of excellence to meet the problems that lie ahead, and to be certain that moral virtue will prevail. Never in the history of mankind is this inculcation and implementation of the principles and ideas of masonry so important, and yet apathy, indifference, and complacency are so common even within our own ranks. If masonry is to continue to exist and to be effective, we must relinquish passive principles and become an aggressive vital force to this nation and among its people. Masonry, by its very origin, has no choice. It must be a living, breathing force. Masonry must act through a body of idealistic men applying Masonic principles to a way of life and bringing about the accomplishment of its goals. We must have Masons who will match in fortitude and courage those who face the rack of the Inquisition and the bitter cold of Valley Forge. Masons who are alert and faithful to their convictions and who are ready to struggle to win liberty again in each generation. We owe this to our country. We owe this to our people and our way of life. We owe it to ourselves and particularly we owe it to the leaders of tomorrow. Let us reawaken the sleeping giant, the greatest force for mankind ever conceived in the minds of men. Let us, too, stand up and be counted. All right, now it's time to support the show. So if so, if you'd like to support this show, you can do that a few different ways. We do have the support the show links where you can click through to a number of different places to do some shopping, like onit.com, freemasonryart.com, or freemasontees.com. All of those are really cool places to go to get some unique items. You can use the coupon code WCY and you'll get 10% off, and they donate a little bit back to this show to help keep those lights on. And something to keep in mind is that when you click through our links and use our coupon code, it doesn't jack the prices up 10% just to bring it down 10%. You know, it's no different than it would be if you just went to the website yourself. Uh, so we can, we've worked that out for you. In addition, there is the limited edition shop where you can pick up our lapel pin and a couple other choice items as well as Brother Stephen L. Harrison's book, Freemasons, Tales from the Craft, which is a phenomenal book of great little short stories and they make great conversation starters they make really good starters to research papers that's a phenomenal book so if you pick it up from me tales from the craft comes to you shipped for 18 dollars. now that's the same price as amazon.com anywhere in the continental united states and for that 18 dollars, you're going to get it from a brother to a brother we can inscribe it for you and i promise you our packaging is better in addition to that we do ship it internationally and if you would like international uh we will do that anywhere else on the planet for 25 bucks and uh, we eat the cost of the rest uh, we don't make much profit on those international sales at all all the profits to that go back to brother stephen l harrison i believe he is using those profits to donate to the charities for the scottish right i believe don't quote me on that, but I know it is going to a charity, so it is a good cause. And the last thing you can do is a direct PayPal donation. So if you don't want anything in return, you just want to toss a few dollars toward the show, that's really cool too. And if you do that, 
I'm still going to send you a thank you card, and you'll probably get a little help in too, just for donating to the show. It's it's our way of saying thank you very much for everything you guys have done making this show. We've got over half a million downloads, and the show is downloaded more than 20,000 times every month, uh, making this show uh, one of the most successful Masonic podcasts in the history of this niche subject of masonry and uh, internet radio. So for that, you know, we thank you so much. I thank you. I always say we, and really it's just, it's me and basically my wife who puts up with uh, this show. So thank you guys so much for all of your support over the years and all of the episodes we've done. So again, thank you. And speaking of Stephen L. Harrison, which I mentioned just a few minutes ago, his book, Freemasons, Tales from the Craft. He also has another book called Freemasonry Crosses the Mississippi. Now, if you can find a print version of that book for less than $100, you're catching a deal. Uh, It's a great book, but it is out of print, and it's phenomenal. I'm lucky enough to have a copy myself, uh, but I believe it is a second edition. But he just released another great fun book, and it's called Freemasons at Oak Island. And it's, it's like 60 or 70 pages. It's somewhere around there on my Kindle and it's a phenomenal read, and you can blast through it in about an hour or so, hour and a half of uh, intense reading. And it is intense reading because you just can't stop reading. You don't want to put it down. It's chock full of facts. Uh, the conjecture is taken aside, and Brother Steve really goes through there, and he deciphers what you, you should take away as probable and you should probably dismiss as not probable. But he does a great job in that book, and so you can pick that up on Kindle for like 99 cents, so you have no excuse. Uh, I think it's only like a dollar, maybe it might be two or three dollars, but uh, in any case, it's very inexpensive and you get way more out of it than what you paid in toward. Check it out. And because Stephen L. Harrison does that, you know, he is also on this show every other week bringing you the Masonic Minute. Brother Stephen L. Harrison puts these together. He records them. I just master the audio and throw it up on, uh, I mix it into the show. And he also puts a video together and we publish those videos on WCY Podcast on YouTube. So if you want to jump over there and subscribe, then you'll get those every other week to the Masonic Minute. This week, Brother Stephen L. Harrison is back with the Masonic Minute. Minute, and we'll go into that right now. The account of Harry Truman's evening in Beach Grove Lodge has been told many times. You've probably heard about it, but in case you haven't, this, in a nutshell, is what happened. A U.S. Navy sailor assigned to Harry Truman's presidential yacht, Williamsburg, knowing about Brother Truman's interest in Freemasonry, told the President he would soon be receiving his third degree. In the conversation that followed, Truman realized his upcoming whistle-stop campaign tour would take him through Indianapolis near Beech Grove Lodge number 694 where the event would take place. Since President Truman and his employees shared an interest in history, Truman had come to know the young man well. So he told him if they could coordinate things, he would attend. The young man's lodge made every effort to ensure the event would happen when the President's campaign was in town. On the day of the event, President Truman's train stopped in Noblesville, Indiana. The young man joined the president there and they rode the 20 remaining miles to Indianapolis together. That evening, Brother Harry slipped out of the back of his train car and went to the lodge. There, he was given an honorary seat in the East, raised the young man, and made some poignant remarks about the Bible and the fraternity. President Truman undoubtedly met every man in attendance that evening as they all shared an iconic moment of Masonic Brotherhood. This all sounds like the stuff of which urban legends are made, but it's all true. In addition to the main event, the raising of a brother, a couple of incidents emphasize most worshipful Brother Truman's dedication to the fraternity. Some of the Secret Service agents accompanying Truman were not Freemasons. However, as Truman was about to enter the tiled lodge, they demanded admission along with him. It was their job to protect him. In his well-known direct manner, Brother Truman told these agents 
he was safer inside the lodge room without them than he was outside with them. Not many people won little disagreements with Harry Truman, who entered the lodge room while the Secret Service agents, who were not members of the fraternity, stood guard outside, under the direction of the Tyler. After the ceremony was over, Truman came out to find two Indiana politicians who had arrived after finding out about the president's attendance. They asked the president to pose with them. Truman complied. After the photographer snapped the first picture, someone asked for another shot. Truman agreed, and as the photographer posed him, he shifted his hands so Truman's Masonic ring was covered. Truman asked if they were taking the photo over so his Masonic ring would not show. The politicians informed him there were Democrats who didn't approve of Freemasonry, and they wanted a picture without the ring. Truman did not mince words. Then to hell with it, he snapped, and refused to permit the photographer to take the second picture. These are true stories that have become legend within the Masonic fraternity, but the accounts of that evening often leave out something very important. What about the brother, most worshipful brother Truman raised that evening? Did he become, as we pray in the first degree, a true and faithful brother among us? His name was Donald Bauermeister. Whatever became of him, We'll explore that next time. In the meantime, for the Whence Came You podcast, I'm Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right. One of my favorite things on the show, the Masonic Minute with Brother Stephen L. Harrison. I should say illustrious Brother Stephen L. Harrison. He is one of the hardest working men in Masonry, and he got his 33rd degree just a little while back. Again, check out his books, Freemasonry Crosses the Mississippi, Freemasons at Oak Island, and Freemasons Tales from the Craft. Three great books. Now, we're going to go into this week's famous Freemason, but first, we're going to have a little bit of a preface for this. So, Greece has been in the news a lot, and if you guys don't know, you're not following it, they had a debt crisis over there, and uh, Greece is a phenomenal, awesome place, and it always has been. It has a special place in uh, the Masons' hearts, because, right, we, we like the architecture, and we talk about the orders of architecture, and all these great things. And so, this one is, I have some preface for you, and we'll go into that, which is, uh, the first Freemason's Lodge in Greece was created in 1782 on Corfu. At the time, the island was still under Venetian rule, while most of the rest of Greece was occupied by the Ottomans. The lodge's name was Beneficia and was under the direction of the Grand Lodge of Verona based in Padova, Italy. And during that period, there were quite a few Greek people residing or studying in northern Italy, and they were the ones who formed the nucleus of the first Greek lodge. Now, soon they would spread the organizational structure of Freemasonry all around the Greek diaspora in Europe. And so in 1790 in Vienna, an organization similar in some respects to the Masons was formed by Greek merchants and intellectuals. It was called Bon Cousins, and was presumably associated with the Greek pre-revolutionary intellectual Regis Ferios, one of the leading figures in spreading revolutionary ideas idea among the Greeks still under Turkish occupation. This era was one of intellectual ferment following the American and French revolutions and thus offered an excellent environment for the dissemination of new ideas. This ideological development would ultimately lead to the dissolution of the world of empires and the emergence of the nation-state. In the case of Greece, it seems that the lodges became veritable repositories of knowledge, where the information and ideas needed to start an uprising were collected and shared with a select few. Usually, these were Greeks of the diaspora who had the intellectual capacity as well as the capital to take the first decisive revolutionary actions. After 1789, a series of Masonic lodges opened throughout the Seven Islands off the western Greek coast. 
islands such as Corfu, Kefalonia, Lefgada, Ithaca, Zakynthos, and at that time, these represented the only area in the Hellenic world in relative to peace and prosperity being as they were under Venetian control. So our famous Freemason is Regus Ferios, or he was born in 1757 and he passed away in 1798 and he was a Greek writer, political thinker, and revolutionary, active in the modern Greek Enlightenment, remembered as a Greek national hero, a victim of the Balkan uprising against the Ottoman Empire, and a pioneer of the Greek War of Independence. So he was born to a wealthy family in the village of Velestino in Sanjak in the Ottoman Empire, modern-day Thessaly, Greece. He was at some point nicknamed Ferios, after a nearby ancient Greek city of Fere, but he does not seem ever to have used this name himself. He is also sometimes known as Constantinos or Constantine Regis. He is often described as being of Aromanian ancestry, with his native village of Velestino being Aromanian. The Regis family had its roots in Perivoli, another Aromanian village, but it usually overwintered in Velestino. However, some scholars question whether there is good evidence for this. Regis was educated at a school of Ampelachia and Larissa. Later, he became a teacher in the village of Kissos, and he fought the local Ottoman presence. At the age of 20, he killed an important Ottoman figure and fled to the uplands of Mount Olympus, where he enlisted in a band of soldiers led by Spiros Zeres. He later went to the monastic community of Mount Athos, where he was received by Cosmas, and from there to Constantinople, where he became a secretary to the Phenariote Alexander Ypsilantis. Arriving in Bucharest, the capital of Ottoman Wallachia, Regis returned to school, learned several languages, and eventually became a clerk for the Wallachian prince, Nicholas Mavrongens. When the Russo-Turkish War, 1787-1792, broke out, he was charged with the inspection of the troops in the city of Krajova. Here he entered into friendly relations with an Ottoman officer named Osman Pazvantaglu, afterwards the rebellious Pasha of Vidin, whose life he saved from the vengeance of Mavrogenes. He learned about the French Revolution and came to believe something similar could occur in the Balkans, resulting in self-determination for the Christian subjects of the Ottomans. He developed the support for an uprising by meeting Greek bishops and guerrilla leaders. After the death of his patron, Regis returned to Bucharest to serve for some time as Dragoman at the French consulate. At this time, he wrote his famous Greek version of La Marseille the anthem of French revolutionaries, a version familiar through Lord Byron's paraphrase as Sons of the Greek Arise. He entered into communion with the general Napoleon Bonaparte, to whom he sent a snuff box made of the root of bay laurel taken from a ruined temple of Apollo, and eventually he set out with a view to meet the general of the army of Italy in Venice. While traveling there, he was betrayed by Demetrios Kazanites, a Greek businessman, had his papers confiscated, and was arrested at Trieste by the Austrian authorities. An ally of the Ottoman Empire, Austria was concerned the French Revolution might provoke similar upheavals in its realm and later formed the Holy Alliance. He was handed over with accomplices to the Ottoman governor of Belgrade, where he was imprisoned and tortured. From Belgrade, he was to be sent to Constantinople to be sentenced by Sultan Selim III. While in transit, he and his five collaborators were strangled to prevent their being rescued by Regis' friend, Osman Pazvantaglu. Their bodies were thrown into the Danube River. His last words are reported as being, I have sown a rich seed. The hour is coming when my country will reap its glorious fruits. And that's it for this week. I hope I didn't butcher Greek too awfully. I'm sure I did. I do apologize to our Greek speakers and people who know how to pronounce Greek better than I do, obviously. If you can, find us on Facebook. We're not hard to find. Uh, just type in Whence Came You Anywhere, and I'm sure we will come up. You can find us there. You can follow us on Twitter at Whence Came You. Check us out on Google Plus at the email address wcypodcast at gmail.com. Don't forget about the Midnight Freemasons, publishing three amazing articles every week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, guys. You like education? Clearly you do. This is where you can find some. You'll get great information, great opinions, some heavy subjects for sure, but one thing is always a constant. It's quality. And even Brother James Dillman of the Quarry Project said so. So you can take that to the bank. Please don't forget about TMR, the Masonic Round Table, that is, every Tuesday at 10, 9 central. We're going to go live every Tuesday. 
So don't miss it. You can uh, interact with us uh, while we're on the air through Twitter and also on our Facebook page. So it's really fun. Please check out Stephen L. Harrison's books, Tales from the Craft, which you can get from me. And you can also check out Freemasons at Oak Island, which is available on Amazon. We'll have links to all those and more in the show notes. Next week, we're going to have Frater O back on the program. It's been a couple weeks, so we miss him. I know you guys do. I miss him too, so we got to get him back on, and we'll have some deep conversations. And also, I did want to quickly mention that, again, we did finish the digitally remastering of several of the Manly P. Hall lectures. No more is there white noise in the background and cars honking, and you can barely hear Hall talk. You don't have to worry about it anymore. We've cleaned them up. I have completely digitally remastered mastered them they are in 320 kilobyte stereo dual channel dual channel stereo that is they're awesome and there's a bunch of them and so i'm trying to figure out a way to host them somewhere for no cost uh, which is proving somewhat difficult Uh, but in any case i will get them to you as soon as i possibly can if nothing else i will host them on a google drive and send you a link so hopefully that happens soon with that stay in the level guys for whence came you i'm robert johnson